Okay, we start with a new topic today, thermal oxidation of silicon. SiO2 is the most important material in VLSI technology and uh, since it is very, very important, we we'll like to study it little more carefully if not in that detail. So, we'll look into the structure of SiO2 and their properties and its properties. We look into kinetics of thermal growth of silicon. This is necessary for modeling of the oxidation process. We will also look into SiO2 interface. Uh, this is very important for the electrical uh, properties of a mass transistor or a mass capacitor or a fin fit or whatever it is. And therefore, we will look into it not so much detail from the physics point of view, but at least characterization and we will see what parameters we are looking into to interface circuit in, uh, models. Then we will look into how some of those properties are characterized and we will finally look into how oxides are actually grown. So, this is the uh, some kind of content of this uh, lectures or this area. I repeat this is nothing to remember this just to say. If you look at the history of uh, mass uh, circuits, the technology of MOS is used in creation of silicon ICs owe most of its credit to SI SiO2 system. In fact, uh, when we started calling silicon ICs, we should have really called silicon dioxide ICs. If there would not have been silicon dioxide, pure silicon ICs would not have existed except for bipolars, but certainly not MOS or even bipolar making would have been impossible. So, of course, uh, that is why it says SiO2 is the most important material in VLSI. We need to grow different kinds of oxides and different thicknesses for variety of steps in the integer circuit fab. First is field oxide which is typically can be as low as maybe even these days maybe 2000 Armstrongs as well, but typically 4000 to 1.4 micron is the field oxide. Then we need to ma create a mask many times even for implant or uh, even for uh, impurities not to go through, we need oxides of the kind of 600 Armstrong to 4000 Armstrongs. And then we need gate oxidation if you are making MOS transistors and with no high case right now, then you for a gate dielectric we will require a good gate oxide and typically it may be 10 Armstrong to 1000 Armstrong depending on the node of technology. For example, 1000 Armstrong was useful for 1 micron technology or maybe even more whereas 1 nanometer and equivalent of that or less than that is recently going for 45 nanometer down. Then we also need to have a pad oxide and we will see what is one of the uh, spacer technology in the case of min finfet has some kind of padding. Then uh, we also see a chemical oxide which is naturally grown or by during RCA cleaning and that also is over. this may be very thin may be uh, of the order of 10 Armstrong to 50 Armstrongs, but these are all kinds of oxides are grown and required in the case of making an IC. These oxide thicknesses of course varies and therefore many of the process steps may vary for different oxide. For example, if you are doing a field oxide of very thick ox uh, thickness 1, 1 micron or so, the gate oxidation is very small, very thin. So, the same technique cannot be used for field oxide because the time taken then will be very huge. Okay. So, we will change the technology as and when it needed and we will see how SiO2 is grown in variety of methods and here are few of the methods if you are noted down. Okay. We'll, the word field essentially means all around, okay. we will see what, what exactly that around. Technologies which are used for creation of SiO2 are generally, generally two kinds. There is one more which I forgot, maybe I will add which is what current we are doing. This process was actually we worked in 1984-86 and was given out. Now suddenly with thin oxide requirement this process has come after 25 years back in a big way. So, when we grew in 1986-85, people were saying that who is going to use this oxide, but now it is found that that is very important process. Okay. 
So thermal oxidation of two kinds will use dry oxidation and weight oxidation, weight stand for H2O. Deposition techniques, uh, we will have CVDs, PVDs, PVD includes, includes sputtering and also plasma oxidation is also partly physical vapor depositions. Rapid thermal oxidation and soil gel process, solution gel process which is mostly used by solar cell people. Thermal oxidation is most basic oxidation and is most important step in creation of gate oxide in a MOS transistor and therefore we will look into what is the uh, growth techniques, what is the property, what are the properties of this gate oxide which is needed to have a good electrical circuit, electrical parameters for MOS transistors. So I repeat there are mostly two techniques in which oxide can be uh, grown, one is thermal oxidation which actually silicon converts into silicon dioxide by thermal process whereas in the other case substrate is immaterial we can deposit on any substrate including silicon okay. So the deposition techniques has advantage that it can be deposited on any surface whereas thermally grown oxide has to be out of silicon because this that is what it is oxidizing. Uh, so the property obviously one can see that thermal oxides will have better properties compared to any deposited oxide. Okay, so as I say we will look into variety of oxidation procedures, however we will model these two and I will not model here this CVD and PVD because there is a separate chapter of separate part of the course we will discuss about CVDs, PVDs of different materials and during that time we will actually model CVD process and a PVD process. PVD is essentially sputtering, evaporation and that kind we will see in molecular beam taxi all these are PVDs. So we will look into models for them in general and not necessarily for oxide. It can be nitride, it can be metals, it can be anything. So deposition can be of any material on any material, other material. So we will see there but we will certainly look into the models which are related to thermally grown oxides typically by two processes dry oxidation and weight oxidations. So I said okay this is what we are really looking for. Before we start uh, let us look into basic properties of SiO2 why it became so popular actually. So let us look at this first thing we want to see a bond, a bonding situation. The natural bond for SiO2 is SiOSI okay, the natural bond for uh, SiO2 is SiOSI uh, and typically the figure which is shown here if this is your silicon atom it is surrounded by 4 oxygen atoms okay. Slightly shown better way same figure uh, the distance bond length as it is called uh, oxygen to oxygen bond has a length of 2.62 Armstrongs, silicon to oxygen has a bond length of 1.62 Armstrongs and silicon to any other next silicon is a bond length around around 3 Armstrongs. If you see SiO bond the silicon lattice oxide lattice may look SiOSI, SiOSI, SiOSI and if you keep doing this OSI and so on and so forth. Okay. So this is how silicon dioxide lattice is created. So one can see from here which is most important thing we will see oxygen is not free it is bonded on both sides by silicon atoms okay and this is a very strong bond okay this is a very of course it is not stronger than silicon to silicon which is the strongest but at least it is still quite a strong bond. So if I want to take oxygen I to break this and I must apply energy to break this bond actually. We will see this this is most important in actually growth models. If you have seen this lengths are just for the sake of it, I mean just to give an idea what kind of lattice structures one has, okay. If you have noted down then maybe we will start ahead. Why we are using SiO2 in a MOS technology, please for gate material in specific or otherwise, because it is an excellent dielectric material and since it is a very good dielectric material it is used in the field effect transistors because it does not allow DC current to flow through it okay. It is excellent dielectric material, uh, it is available in two phases amorphous phase and crystalline phase. 
uh, we are already I have told you a crystalline phase of SiO2 is quartz whereas the oxide which we use in all VLSR technology is always in amorphous phase. Uh, as I just now said thermally grown oxides are amorphous in nature and uh, typical atomic structure of SiO2 with some impurities of ions are shown below. The lattice is random this is say for example SiO or this but this oxygen around is also connected to another say silicon atom then it is called bridging bond whereas this silicon atom and if I create another oxygen on this, this is free to it and it is called non-bridging. It does not have another silicon on the other side then it is called non-bridging. So to break a non-bridging bond is easier compared to a bridge bond because bridge bond means two silicon will hold it and if one oxygen is free other side that oxygen probably can be taken away. Okay. There can be possibility of some kind of uh, impurities inside the lattice. Uh, which is in at interstitial sites these are called network modifier and network formers and we will look into it. There is also a possibility between silicon atoms or oxygen atom there may be a formation of OH ions or OH bonding and this is very important in many cases at least for weight oxides. The silicon is going to oxygen and there is no silicon ahead so the oxygen is dangling right now the other bond so it is free, free to cut out very fast it is not bonded other side. So non-bridged okay. like this OH has nothing here OH is also non-bridged okay. anything connected other side it bridged. Hmm. So based on this lattice there are some observations we can make and uh, of course as I said these are not the way book writes but I think I will give simple observations out of all this structure if you have drawn this this is given in a book plumber's book and any other book. Okay. There is a book by Kalkleser Microelectronics Technology or something old book but has new edition has come I am told Kalkleser I am not sure whether we have one but many of the old technology models and everything are well given in Kalkleser's book. From the uh, some observations about the lattice uh, from the lattice structure of SiO2 we observe that if silicon has to leave SiO2 lattice it must break force oxygen bonds SiO bonds it is bonded on the four sides so it must leave all four of them while if oxygen atom has to leave it, ha it needs only one bond if it is non bridging and two bonds if it is bridging okay. SiO2 with no impurities like diffusing impurities or sodium lead or barium is called intrinsic silica if there are no impurities in oxide then it is called intrinsic silica or intrinsic SiO2. While if there are impurities then we call it as extrinsic silica. Okay. So these are few uh, this there are few more if you note down I repeat the SiO S, when silicon leaves the SiO2 bond it leads it is very difficult because it needs 4 bonds to be broken okay. whereas oxygen is only 2 or in non bridging it is only 1 so it just goes away. Okay. This property has been used during oxidation that this oxygen is available I can break it okay. Is it okay? Uh, our ultimate aim today is to actually go through the model but let us see how fast we go okay. So that I can ask tomorrow some question on models. <laughs> I keep telling you our interest in the course is manifold. One is to understand the material properties so that at least one out of hundred odd people here, let us say joint technology and also thinks 20 years ahead what he can do to become an entrepreneur of his own technology uh, fab house in India somewhere. Okay. The boron, phosphorus or arsenic or such such impurities in silicon and hence create bond between oxygen and them such impurities are called network formers because oxygen will also get bonded to them. However, if impurities sit in the interstitial site and then they modify the net see example these impurities can sit on a silicon. So yeah instead of silicon you have impurity in 4 oxygen bonds which is similar I mean uh, similar as SiO bond it will be impurity OSI bond whereas if the 
impurity is sitting in interstitial site, it still will form, form a bond with oxygen and they will modify the structure of network. Such materials which do that is called is because of Na2O, barium oxide, uh, then there is a lead oxide PBO, PB2O3, then comes to another phase of PB which is PBO, there is a tin oxide which I forgot, these are called network formers or uh, modifiers, whereas the impurities when they replace silicon, these are called network formers. Okay. Please remember these impurities are only present in some traces one part per billion or lower but it is not that they are 0 because due to the processing we pass gases, we have heated materials around. So some impurities will be always there, how small we make them is most important. If we have a SiO2 is put into water, it is very interesting thing that this SiO Si bond reacts with HOH which is water to form SiOH SiOH bond. Okay, this is very important silicon hydroxyl bonds, this is silicon hydroxyl, so two such uh, molecules actually uh, gets bonded and this is the most important thing why weight oxides can be grown. Okay. One more interesting feature of SiO2 is that it is strong hydrophilic, water attracts to the surface of SiO2 and bonds and actually create this hydroxyl bonds. So one test that we have a silicon surface or oxide surface is just dip it into water. If water sticks, that means there is a SiO2 layer. If water does not stick, it is a silicon layer. Okay. okay so these are some properties of uh, this and we also know when Na2O kind of structure gets into silicon dioxide lattice, we call soda glass. Okay. These are very bad kind of glasses very impure, large amount of potassium, sodium first group elements actually forms oxides there and they are not very good as far as the properties of mass structures are concerned. So we must avoid sodium, potassium, barium in the lab as much as possible, probably 0 but nothing is 0, so something lower than 0. So these material, this is what I say, the other one we of course said that if there is an impurity oxides along with the silicon dioxide, these are called silicate glasses. If you have boron, then it is called borosilicate glass. If it is phosphorus, it is called phosphosilicate glass. If it is arsenic, then it is arsenosilicate glass. So these glasses are good, sometimes they are used as the impurity sources because they have the impurity in them, but the mixture is called glasses. Okay silicate glasses. Pyrex is essentially borosilicate glass. Borosil is the company in India which manufactured Pyrex. Okay, there are for certain properties of SiO2 which are very relevant for our at least some electrical properties are relevant for us even as these days optical properties because silicon has been used in opto devices uh, not necessarily for electrical behavior for optical gratings. Uh, many of the communication people are now looking for optical communication and gratings are one of the most important element in optical communication. So you need to know gratings index, so how do I change the index? Okay. So okay, the typical resistivity of SiO2 is very high 10 to the power 16 ohm centimeter, our conductivity should be less than 10 to the power minus 16 mahos per centimeter. The band gap of SiO2, actually this is slightly misnomer, why I say misnomer? The band gaps are only available for crystalline materials because there is a periodicity, there is no periodicity in amorphous materials. So there is, uh, this is only a matter of conjecture that there is a band gap in a small crystallite and that band gap is typical if the order of 9 electron volts. Uh, what essentially what is the silicon band gap 1.1 electron volt so it is much easier even at room temperature to create whole electron pairs because the band gap energy is very small germanium it is 0 0.6 so even more easy so the intrinsic carrier concentration of germanium is higher than silicon because its band gap is lower if the band gap is of 9 electron volt so at room temperature it would be almost impossible for whole electron pair to form and therefore no conduction and therefore large resistivity. Okay. 
a typical refractive index for SiO2 is 1.45, density is 2.22, the number of you should write grams per cc. Normally this definition are slightly I did not write specifically because there is something in the case of molecular densities there is a Avogadro number appears. So think of it why I did not write the full density units. The number of atoms per cc is 2.3 into 10 power 22 per cc, direct constant of silicon dioxide is 3.9. This is much of the major uh, parameter in decision of the mass transistor performance epsilon and we know we are trying to go for higher epsilon oxides. Uh, high K materials because of some reasons we will see them later. Uh, another problem which most of the oxides particularly gate oxide you are applying a VGS across the gate and uh, thickness is very thin because you are scaling down. So the and voltage is not scaling down. So voltage divided by the thickness of oxide is the field across the oxide which is increasing as the technology node is reducing. Now this field which you are getting should be less than 10 to the power 7 because at 10 to the power 7 all bonds can be broken and we say dielectric ionization will start. So any anything voltage you can apply is as much as that the field is at least a order of half of 10 to the power 4, 500 to the power 6 of 4 into 10 to the power 6 should be the best of volt per centimeter should be the applied fields. So safety, then you do not actually most of the oxide even do not reach 10 to the power 7. Most oxide in our lab you may get strengths of 4 into the power 6, 5 into the power 6. So safe oxide fields are only 10 to the power 6 volt per centimeter. So your thickness if you decide then your voltage is essentially decide that it should reduce the field below 10 to the power 6, okay. This is a compulsory requirement that is why otherwise in a circuit I may go VDD of 5 volt for a 10 ohm strong circuit also how what is the bad thing in that I will push it but by then oxide will puncture okay. So this is an important property which SiO2 has not most materials have this high strengths okay even a half neum oxide is lower than this. So the major problem with many other high K is their direct strength is as is not as good as SiO2 and therefore SiO2 is taking for last 50 years do what they do. Of course, now we have to change for some reasons we will see later. SiO2 has strong utility of IC processing. Why we want to use SiO2? Firstly, of course, its electrical properties are great and everything is fine, but it is much easier to create as well as to etch. You know, a silicon dioxide HSN2, for example, SiO2 plus let us say HF, so I want 4 can give me as 4 SIF which is plus H2O, SIF silicon fluoride is uh, soluble in water. So if I put my silicon dioxide dome wafer into HF then it will get removed all of the HF in the HF forming silicon fluorides and uh, water inside the water. So it is very easy to etch. And therefore, of course, fluorine has its own advantage and disadvantages some other day, okay. So please remember that SiO2 has is much easier to grow, much easier to etch, much easier to control in every sense, best dielectric strengths, very good uh, EGs, very good insulator, okay. And refract index is also very good for many optical circuits, okay. So all in all, glass is very good glass is very good and glass of something is even better, okay. The other properties which you see in the case of most impurities in silicon have poor diffusion coefficient in SiO2. Like silicon, uh, arsenic, antimony, phosphorus, all these impurities are boron, everything has a very pure diffusivity in SiO2 compared to silicon. So they act like a mask, no impurity can easily pass through oxide compared to what it will go into silicon. Uh, Another important feature of SiO2 is it is extremely stable. What do you mean by stable? Its structure does not change easily and uh, it remains for all full processing SiO2 properties do not change, okay. So essentially it is stable with temperature, with everything, it is very, very stable material 
and therefore extremely useful in all IC because ICs have to last tens of years or at least these days 3 to 4 years. So why the life is not now 10 years which earlier we used to say because companies will collapse if things work out for 10 years what will they do then? Huh? So they will finish 3 years it must go. Uh, Another advantage of silicon is uh, silicon dioxide is the interface between SI and SiO2 is ideal if not it is very good if not ideal and it is extremely reproducible many number of times in any IC processing. Any number of times you go you can have a control on this interface that is why it is very good. When silicon is oxidized there is a volume expansion this is very important when silicon is oxidized there is a volume expansion total here is a shown here the dark one is silicon which you have and I started putting oxygen ambient and oxidizes. So what it does is it consumes certain amount of silicon to convert into SiO2 but the volume of that is larger than the silicon volume which you consume. This is essentially because of the law of mass action. NS excess must be equal to NOX ES uh, XOX and uh, since the NS NOX has a ratio on silicon and SiO2 concentration is given this typical ratio of this on number of atoms per cc is 5 and 2.3 ratio is actually appearing in the ratio of silicon to oxide ratio and so one can see 0.46 of silicon, 4.46 of micron of silicon will grow how much oxide? 1 micron of oxide. Is that clear to you? 0.46 Armstrong uh, uh, microns of uh, silicon will consume to create 1. So oxide will grow above, 0.46 will grow inside and 0.54 will go above and this is the figure which shows this 0.46 inside and so it volume expansion and essentially because of the density ratio or because of the concentration ratio essentially. So that is important if someone says I have only this much surface of silicon so please remember when you oxidize it its volume will increase at least 50 percent above and 50 percent below okay and accordingly oxide will be available okay. So you can see from here uh, there is an oxide layer See rest, let us say I do select you maybe and that is very important if you have noted down I will just show you a figure which is called local oxidation. So silicon thickness is roughly 0.46 or for simplicity you may say 50-50, 50% SI will convert it to 100% SiO2. What value of? No, 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 the ratio is 0 0.46. If it is 1 micron of this, then it is 0 0.46 micron, the ratio is 0 0.46. Okay. So if I want an oxide thickness of 1 micron, you must be this that 0 0.46 micron silicon must be made available to grow that much silicon dioxide. Okay. That is what I say, I will just show you a figure. If this is my silicon surface and I restrictively do oxidation only here, okay. So what will happen? I will get oxide something like this. The rest places is surface is here, but the selective oxidation process, part of the oxide is above, and in fact there will be some diff, uh, something called taper down. So now you can see this is how the oxides are actually protecting the rest of area this much is your field oxide as we shall see this process this selective this is called local we will do this process later oxidation of silicon and it is called low cost. So in actual IC making wherever you do not want impurities to go the field oxide is generally grown by process of low cost only those areas oxidized but the silicon surface is retained wherever your actual device is going to come is that correct. So that is very important that oxide thickness is roughly double that of silicon thickness consumed okay. okay. So this uh, 
this roughly tells about the properties and some comments on SiO2, some observations. Now we start today uh, our basic modeling issue. We have discussed earlier that properties we will look into. So we looked into properties. We now start looking into the models or how oxide is actually grown. Is it okay everyone? The process of growth is essentially thermally related in thermal oxidation and the process is essentially whenever it is related to thermodynamics we say it is kinetics that is some species moving and reacting reaction. Any reaction is has a kinetic model okay. So we will look into kinetics of thermal oxidation of silicon. As I say silicon dioxide is generally grown by oxidation of silicon at higher temperatures. Typical temperatures could be 800 degree to 1200 degree. Obviously one can think very simply that lower the temperature thickness will be smaller, larger the temperature oxidation will continue at higher temperatures will have higher thickness oxidation rates okay. And generally done in an oxygen ambient, uh, typically ambients used are either oxygen, pure oxygen or pure water. Of course, there is a mixture of water and oxygen which is called partial pressures of oxygen in H2O or, or steam partial pressure in this ambient. These are called pyrogenic systems, we will discuss this later. So the weight oxide when I say tomorrow, next time, uh, the weight oxidation is essentially not a steam oxidation, is that part clear? When the steam will come out, uh, when the water is heated at what temperature steam comes? 100 degree. Weight oxides are not steam oxides. So we do 95 degree heating. So only water vapors come which are bubbling, I mean you see the bubbler system and they are used in the this but there is no full steam. So there is some oxygen content in the steam part and that is why it is called weight oxidation. It is not called steam oxidation. The typical reactions which are very simple Si plus O2 at high temperatures of 800 to 1200 converts into SiO2 and if the only oxygen is the ambient then it is called dry oxidation. This is the most common oxide thickness, oxide growing procedure when you want thin oxides, okay, dry oxidations. SiO2 is also formed by oxidation silicon and water vapors. Actually it is a process is quite complicated, maybe I will show you quickly something. However, overall one may say Si plus 2H2O is SiO2 plus 2H2O, this is overall reaction, this is called weight oxidation, okay. Uh, very those who are little more interest in models of chemistry or chemical engineering or material science here is what can happen, high temperatures, 800 to 1200 is a high temperature, room temperature is 27 degree. Okay. Oxides cannot be grown below 800 is not correct statement, any temperature it will grow but the um, required thicknesses cannot be attained at lower than 800. But water vapor. Oxidation is performed on the silicon which is heated to 800 to 1200, we will see the technology. The water vapors are coming and reacting with the silicon vapors which are held at 800 to 1200 degrees centigrade, okay. That is why it is high temperature. Water vapor is at 95, okay. Here is something what chemistry can do. Uh, an H2O can react with SiO, SiO bond and form SiOH, SiOH uh, hydroxyl bonds. This hydroxyl bonds can react with silicon, silicon, silicon bond and may form SiO, Si, SiO, Si plus water H hydrogen. This hydrogen may react with unfinished, unbridged bonds or non-bridged bonds OSI and may convert into OH, Si and this OH, Si is essentially going back. SiOH and again it will react with silicon to form SiO2. So this is a ring rigmarole system and it keeps doing itself to get 
SiOSI bonds, okay. So if you really see a chemistry at a given temperature, some may dominate, some may not, so some thickness may not be correct. So those who are really looking for very thin oxide models, these equations may be of relevance, okay. Uh, water attacks O2 bond and creates non-bridging bond, this weakens the network, first part. SiSi to interface OH group react with silicon to form SiO bond which is the structure for SiO2 and hydrogen also actually diffuses through SiO2 layer and reacts with bridging oxygen and lo it loses the network as it shows. Okay. The basic idea how much oxygen can go inside is there must be some structure in which oxygen can flow ahead. This is how network can loosen and can allow oxygen to move in. Okay. That is what the chemistry is about. Okay. Anyway, if you forget it is fine, but if you those who are very keen should know that there is lot of chemistry goes, lot of thermodynamics associated. For example, say rest of the time I did not show error, but in this case this is a both side reaction and I must maintain certain temperatures to actually have a forward reaction or the reverse backward reactions. Particularly in CVD we will come back and look into forward and reverse reaction very seriously because what is reverse etching, forward depositions. So if you are depositing it may etch, if you are etching it may deposit. So we will have to see when I deposit I deposit, when I etch it does not deposit. Okay. So that time we will come back and do a lot of thermodynamics to see when the reaction is favored on one side or the other. Okay. Uh, Way back in 1965, uh, uh, two scientists from Intel actually first time suggested the kinetic model for oxidation, thermal oxidation and these names are very famous in MOS technology. This is called Bruce Deal and Andy Grove. Uh, Deal is still around, so is Andy. Uh, Deal is still working on SiO2 after 60 years. Okay. Great man, 50 plus years. And he of course was the chief of Intel few years ago and uh, he is not well these days but still on the board of uh, Intel. He is the founder member of Intel. Is that okay? Uh, in 1965 they suggested the model and till very late uh, as late, I mean maybe around 95 to 2000. This grow deal model or deal grow model remained as the only model available. When the oxide thickness started reducing further and further, modifications to grow deal models came started coming in. But these are the words modification. That means the basic tenets of deal grow model remain even now sufficiently valid, though uh, there are ways of saying that they are not correct in every case. What actually deal grow model is suggesting or what are the assumptions it starts with? It actually what why we are looking into I want to grow SiO2 of thickness XO or XOX and I want to see how it is related to temperature and time. I have silicon wafers pushed into a furnace of higher temperature, I pass oxygen ambient and I expect thickness of my choice by deciding the temperature and time. Okay. Now this model should do that, it should be able to be if XO must be proportional to temperature and time. If it shows that, that means I can decide how much oxide thickness I will get at a given temperature after how much time of oxidation okay. or given a time of oxidation fixed, if I change the temperature I can change the thickness. Okay. This is what my aim and therefore I like to see what the model is so that I will be able to derive that part. Or other day when I was showing you some graphs, I have oxide thickness versus time at different temperatures for 111100 wafers. Okay, those graphs have been derived out of this model. Okay, so for our quick calculations, we can use those graphs directly: time versus thickness at different temperatures at different concentrations of wafers. So one can immediately read out how much oxide thickness. Okay. okay so the model assumes, assumes uh, there is a finite layer of thin oxide layer present at on the silicon 
at t is equal to 0 minus before that means before the oxidation start already there a very thin layer of oxide exist. Now this is an issue which is challengeable at times. So if someone actually etches the silicon pure and push it you mean to say oxide will not start oxidation it does but the model expects that there is a finite thickness of oxide at t is equal to 0 minus and 0 plus means oxidation starts just before there is a thin oxide a very very thin oxide. The next it says that the oxidant gas species impinges on this SiO2 layer and not silicon it, oxide. So here is before I write this do not write I will just show you figure and then will you may write. This is the physics uh, physical model a picture of that. This is the gas ambient, this is the gas ambient, this is that thin oxide and this is silicon. Okay. So you got gas on oxidant come here and actually impinges on this SiO2 layer surface. Okay. Now we are saying how much it will reach here, then how much it will reach to the silicon interface to please remember oxide can be grown only when there is a reaction with silicon. So how much oxidation oxidant from the gas will actually reach to the interface to oxidize further silicon that is the model we are looking for. You start with huge amount of gases there is a silicon wafer thin oxide partly it does not allow all of it to go or how much it goes and reacts with silicon to form new SiO2 is that clear. If SiO2 is grown further the flux which is going through may be further reduced because now oxide thickness will be increasing. So we will see what is the model of growth of XO. Okay. This is a figure please note down this figure then I will come back to those ABCs again so that you know what I am talking about. If you have drawn the figure a few names I have suggested here this is CG capital G this at the surface is C small uh, capital S or small s. There is just below that there is a C star, just below that there is a C0. At the silicon silicon dioxide weight concentration is Ci with it has a gradient, and there are three fluxes associated one in the gas phase, other in the oxide, and third entering the silicon. Three fluxes. Flux means amount of oxidant per unit area per unit time, okay. Flux. So there are three fluxes F1 is the oxidant flux in a gas phase, F2 in the oxidant SiO2 phase, F3 is what is reaching at the silicon. Okay. Now this figure is the model figure for Bruce Deal and Andy Gross model which is most important model in thermal oxidations. This the text part I will now explain once you have drawn the figure and maybe if you wish this the fluxes I have written. Okay. The ABC I will repeat again. This figure I will redraw again but since if you are drawn now it will be you do not have to redraw it again. Okay. So is that model clear what we are saying there is a thin oxide present from the gas stream some oxidant arrive at the surface of SiO2 then it goes through oxide with some flux reaches silicon and oxidizes this is the model. Okay. Have you drawn the figure? So I will come back to this. So as I just now said initially there is a finite thickness yes initially there is a finite thickness oxidant gas species impinges on SiO2 layer okay. and now the oxidant species then reacts with silicon as much as it goes through the oxide and creates near oxide layer this is the model we have suggested not be the line group. Okay. This process continues as long as your oxidant is available and oxides keep growing. Assumption is temperature is held constant at a given temperature the gas flows are also constant the oxide but gas is flowing all the time and as long as that flows silicon dioxide will keep increasing in its thickness this is the model. Now we must see that therefore one thing we are clear that as the time increases oxide thickness will grow. So one requirement I said I want to know what is the oxide thickness at the end of my oxidation cycle. 
further I have temperature this right now I kept one temperature if I change the temperature I will see how much additionally oxide grew. Is that okay? So, there are three fluxes which we have talked about uh, three process trans so what are three requirement for oxidation is transport of oxidant from the furnace please remember the way we will discuss the technology later but maybe I will show you the furnace and this is the rack everything is in quads okay these are my wafers sitting on a rack this temperature could be adjusted to 800 degree to 1200 degree sometimes 1250 people have done nothing very serious and oxygen is entering so this is the gas ambient okay at least between this this is called the mid zone so mid zone temperature the gas is heated to this mid zone temperature but the gas is everywhere this is the concentration flux which is entering from here is everywhere okay then it actually reaches to the surface of silicon okay it impinges on silicon this flux which actually impinges on silicon surface or silicon dioxide surface because we assume there is oxide is essentially flux f1 okay the oxidant species then before we uh, this word it has already impinged here then it gets inside SiO2 by the process of diffusion okay because there is no oxidant here there is a oxidant here there is a gradient creation so impure uh, oxidant species diffuses in the SiO2 to reach silicon silicon dioxide interface so the second flux is diffuses through SiO2 to with a flux F2 and the third before I come back again it reaches silicon surface or silicon silicon interface and reacts with silicon to form neuroxide. oxide. So, oxygen reacts with silicon to with flux F3. However, in uh, there are two things we say uh, in devices as well as in any process for that matter thermodynamic process. There are two terms which we use thermal equilibrium and steady state. What does that say? In the case of uh, thermal equilibrium as they, there is no external force applied okay the system is only by thermodynamically adjusting its energy to the minima okay this is the entropy this relationship so first law of thermodynamics says that it should remain valid for any temperature you fix okay it is a equilibrium with the ambient however what we are saying now is we are passing gases so there is a force going on so there is not a equilibrium thermal equilibrium situation however the gas is constant okay if the gas is constant some oxidant is getting in some is impinging some is reacting so system is time invariant that is called steady state so we are looking of a case when it is steady state okay yes so are there no oxygen atoms that form uh, SiO2 on the SiO2 interface that no it does not because there is no SiO, SiO bond oxygen it will actually break it. So, it does not help us actually. As we provide the temperature around 800 degrees. But SiO, SiO bond does not break at 800 degrees. So, very, as I say it is one of the strongest bond. SiO, SiO bond is even stronger. Oxi, uh, SiO, SiO breaks it at 1412. So, that is even higher temperature. But 812 that is why 1200 I said. I did not say 1400 okay. is that okay. So, it does not happen. So, that is why we say it impinges, diffuses and reacts okay. and even if I mean of course, it is not true, but even if I take your word this is not deal Gromer, this is what deal is suggesting okay. Yeah. Firstly, it is not true, but even if it is true you may say modify whatever your good name put say modified deal Gromer model by so and so publish it. Aajkal sab yehi kar rahe na x plus dx ek paper 2 dx dusra paper okay. So, F1 see gold deal grow model was suggested in 65 50 saal ho gaya hila nahi abhi tak isn't it ek paper is sufficient hai na. So, that is what I think 
world has I think now thinking 2 lakh papers are the best scientists, contribution 0. So, F1 is equal, so what is the steady state? We say all three fluxes must be. So, let us stop now because there is nothing we can do.